Good morning and a warm welcome to today's online event to mark International Corporatist Day. My name is Ian Rees and I'm Chair of FLAVA, the Welsh People's History Society. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's event, which has been organised on a collaborative basis between FLAVA and Co-ops and Mutuals Wales. The theme for today's event is Robert Owen's Legacy, What Lessons Can We Learn From the 21st Century? And it's one of a series of events in 2021 to mark the 250th anniversary of Robert Owen's birth. You should all hopefully have received details of the various other events organised by co-ops and Mutuals Wales, which have been taking place since March. And today's event marks the culmination of these celebrations. It will consist of two main sessions, the first led by Clava, and after a short comfort break, the second led by co-ops and Mutuals Wales. We hope to finish around 11.45. Um, just before we get underway, one housekeeping issue. Can I ask everyone to make sure the microphones are muted? Feel free to leave your cameras on um, if you wish. Uh, you, you, uh, if you wish, if you would like to participate at any point, please enter your comment and questions on the chat function. Thank you. So on to today's first session led by Clava, which will consist of a lecture by Clava uh, Stalwart, Professor Chris Williams on does Robert Owen's legacy still resonate in the 21st century? Here to chair the session and introduce our main speaker is long standing Clava member Mick Antonou. Of course, Mick is the Welsh Labour and Cooperative Party member of the Senate for Pontypridd. Mick, many thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today, and over to you. Well, firstly, welcome everyone, Croeso, and uh, um, it's a great honour to be uh, chairing this opening of the event. Um, just to say that uh, uh, Chris Williams, who I'll be introducing in a minute, will speak for approximately 40 minutes and there will be time for questions after that. So if you can put your questions succinctly into the chat room at the end, I'll make sure I take them in batches so everyone gets an opportunity to participate in this. Professor Chris Williams, a professor of history and head of the College of Arts, Celtic Studies and Social Sciences at University College Cork, having previously taught at the Universities of Cardiff, Swansea and Glamorgan. Uh, with the late Noel Thompson, he edited the volume Robert Owen and His Legacy, University of Wales Press of 2011, to which he contributed an essay on Robert Owen and Wales. His essay, Robert Owen, Socialist Visionary, was published in Chlavi, the Journal of Welsh People's History in 2010. So without more ado, I'll go straight over to you, Chris Williams. Thank you very much, uh, Mick. That's very kind of you. And I hope that screen is now visible. Is my screen visible? Yeah, great. Thanks very much indeed. Um, great pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. I know we're on a, a fairly tight schedule, so I will get going uh, straight away. Um, Robert Owen was born 250 years ago this year in Newtown, Montgomeryshire, into a world that were we to be transported back to it would look very, very different uh, from our own. In 1771, George III was only 11 years into his 60 year reign. Uh, both Napoleon Bonaparte and Ludwig van Beethoven were still in nappies. Uh, the American colonies uh, were part of the British Empire. The uh, Adam Smith had yet to write uh, The Wealth of Nations and Captain James Cook had not yet returned from his first journey circumnavigating the globe. The population of England and Wales was a little above 7 million of which only 30% lived in towns. Average life expectancy was 36 years, and only 5% of the adult population had the vote. Now, over the course of the next 87 years, Owen's lifespan, the world would change enormously. Queen Victoria was on the throne when Owen died again in Newtown in 1858. The Indian Rebellion had been brought to a close that summer, and tentative moves were being made towards a second reform bill to follow that of 1832. Karl Marx was living in London and was on the point of putting aside the Grundrisse in order to bang out much more lucrative articles for the New York Daily Tribune. 
The following year, he would outline his materialist conception of history in a, the contribution to the critique of political economy, changing the direction of political thought for more than a century. In 1859, Charles Darwin would publish his Origin of Species, transforming the understanding of human evolution and challenging the common fundamentals of contemporary religious belief. Across the United Kingdom, 9,000 miles of railway line were carrying almost 150 million passengers. More people were living in towns than in the countryside, and the 1861 census would show that the population of England and Wales had trebled over the previous 90 years. Average life expectancy had improved, but only from 36 to 41. Now I begin with this, this brief historical overview in order to emphasize both the essential otherness of the society into which Owen was born and the rapidity with which it changed over the course of his life. And this is important because I believe that we must always see Owen in his context. The great scholar of Owen and the Owenites, J.F.C. Harrison, noted that for each age there is a new view of Mr. Owen. And there is no doubt that Owen's life and writings have been regularly ransacked by those seeking his beyond the grave endorsement to a policy, principle or ethical stance which didn't exist in a recognisable form during his lifetime. Given that he believed that Owenite halls should have high ceilings in order to allow space to disperse bad airs, I'm only waiting for someone to claim him for public health guidelines against the coronavirus. To be so pliable is of course the fate of many great thinkers and Karl Marx and Charles Darwin provide further excellent examples. But it does mean that in seeking 21st century resonances for Owen's ideas, actions and writings, we have to be mindful of the friction involved in transferring them across approximately two centuries of profound social, political, economic and technological change. Owen was born into a different world from ours. He died in a world very different again, but it's still a long way from the Britain of 1858 to that of 2021. To be able to connect back in whatever form and however selectively to what Robert Owen published or did became a common strategy for the British labour and cooperative movements. The inscription on the Owen Memorial in Kensal Green Cemetery in London, erected in 1879, was very close to a socialist canonisation. He originated and organised infant schools. He secured a reduction of the hours of labour for women and children in factories. He was a liberal supporter of the earlier efforts to obtain national education. He laboured to promote international arbitration. He was one of the foremost Englishmen who taught men to aspire to a higher social state by reconciling the interests of capital and labour. He spent his life and a large fortune in seeking to, to improve his fellow men by giving them education, self-reliance and moral worth. His life was sanctified by human affection and lofty effort. Now, an objective assessment of these claims today would need to enter some qualifying statements, not least to the idea that Owen was a foremost Englishman. I think we have to be measured in our evaluation of Owen's achievements, appreciate that he was often part of wider progressive movements and currents of thought, and acknowledge his failings and some of the less attractive aspects of his personality. In the same spirit, we have to be careful when looking to accommodate some of the more recent assessments of Owen's record, neither to fail to appreciate the specific context in which he worked, nor to hold him to anachronistic standards, which tell us more of our own age than of his. So in seeking to answer the question, does Robert Owen's legacy still resonate in the 21st century? I'm going to begin by identifying three aspects of his legacy that for various reasons are problematic, at the same time seeking to understand them in their historical context. But I'm then going to outline three of his ideas and achievements that I think continue very much to hold resonance for human society today. To begin, to begin with the problem areas, it would be remiss of me in the current context not to address head on the issue of Robert Owen and slavery, which has attracted some recent comment. Michael Morris, a senior lecturer in English at Dundee University, published in 2018 an essay titled The Problem of Slavery in the Age of Improvement, David Dale, Robert Owen and New Lanark Cotton. 
the contents of which appear to have influenced the Welsh government's 2020 report, The Slave Trade and the British Empire, an audit of commemoration. And the argument is summarized by the report as follows. Owen's perceptions of slavery as a social reformer and factory owner led him to disagree with emancipation. Although he does not seem to have campaigned against emancipation, he repeatedly compared what he perceived as the satisfactory conditions of the enslaved with those of the working classes. He visited Jamaica in 1829 and on the basis of a day's tour wrote that without the interference of abolitionists, these slaves cannot fail to be generally the happiest members of society for many years to come. The New Lanark mills were reliant on cotton grown by enslaved people in the southern US, the Caribbean and Brazil. Owen endorsed the arguments of slave masters and opposed emancipation in the late 1820s. When he developed his American utopian settlement of New Harmony, Indiana in the mid 1820s, its constitution allowed membership by people of all ages and descriptions, but excluded persons of color, who it suggested might instead be accepted as helpers or enabled to join communities in Africa or elsewhere. Now, parts of this argument are accurate and are valuable in bringing this issue to the fore, although they are not novel. It's well known that the New Lanark mills used slave cotton, as did the British cotton industry in general. Owen's reflections on the quality of life of what were called house slaves in Jamaica were certainly naive, as Frank Podmore had remarked in his 1906 biography of Owen. And New Harmony did not admit people of colour on an equal basis with whites, as Anne Taylor had noted in her 1987 study. But overall, I think the argument is misconceived and ahistorical. First, I think it's guilty of what I would call prejudicial imprecision. To give two examples, the report cited here states that Owen does not seem to have campaigned against emancipation. Well, that would be more accurately and fairly phrased as Owen did not campaign against emancipation because there is no evidence for him having done so. The second example comes from Michael Morris's essay where he cites Owen as writing in his autobiography the following, bad and unwise as American slavery is and must continue to be. Morris then takes Owen to task for not elaborating on why American slavery must continue. But what troubles me here is that Morris has read these words as suggesting that Owen thinks that American slavery must continue. He does not entertain the possibility that what Owen meant was that insofar as slavery in America continues, it must continue to be bad and unwise, which would be my reading. Now, clearly these words are open to interpretation in more than one way, but not to acknowledge that possibility and instead to impose a single interpretation wouldn't be my approach to historical evidence. The second point is that Owen is characterized simply as opposing emancipation. But this ignores a number of pronouncements by Owen, which are critical of slavery. In his debate with Alexander Campbell in 1829, Owen stated, in the new state of existence, slavery will be unknown. It will die a natural death under the preliminary government of the present generation. Owen had lectured in New Orleans the previous year, criticizing the treatment of black people, which as Ian Donachie notes, must have done little to endear him to Southern audiences. In his Memorial to the Mexican Republic in 1828, he praised the Mexicans for having abolished slavery in 1824, thus presenting to the world an example worthy of general imitation. And in his autobiography in 1858, he wrote that slavery could not exist in a true and rational state of society. Now, to my mind, this is not what has been termed a consistent endorsement of the arguments of slave masters. Third, I think that in the attempt to point the finger at Owen, insufficient attention is paid to the context of what he said or when he said it. So Owen's comparison between the lives of slaves and those of workers in Britain's industrial districts is presented as a simple endorsement of the arguments of slavers when it should be read as a rhetorical device focused on highlighting the need to address the conditions of British workers, which was Owen's primary focus. And Owen was by no means the only radical to use such a construct. William Cobbett did the same, as did the black radical Robert Wedderburn, pictured in this print by George Cruikshank on the right there, 
Robert Wedderburn was author of The Horrors of Slavery and Other Writings. Uh, he was opposed to Owen in 1817 over Owen's plans. He later became an Owenite. So he used exactly the same rhetorical trope uh, as did Robert Owen. And he was clearly not endorsing the arguments of slavers. The fact that black people were not admitted to full membership of New Harmony has to be understood in the context that slavery had only been outlawed in Indiana in 1820. That in the west of the states, and New Harmony is right on the border with Illinois, slave owning had been common and not all slave owners had divested themselves of their slaves by 1826. To attempt a racially integrated community in early 19th century America was, um, should we say, ambitious. But nonetheless, Owen in 1825 wrote to his colleague William Allen, suggesting that our operations will soon extend to the Blacks and the Indians. And he held a meeting with Choctaw and Chickasaw chiefs in Washington. Now, the community collapsed before any changes were made, but one of Owen's followers, Francis Wright, did attempt a racially integrated community at Neshoba in Tennessee and noted JFC Harrison, as such, it was well calculated to incur local displeasure. Owen was a trustee of that community, a position he would hardly have accepted if he had any principled objection to racial integration. And indeed, insofar as Owen addressed such issues in his writings, he was committed to positive social change for all, stating that his sole view was to benefit my fellow men of every rank and description of every country and color when he spoke at this address pictured here at the City of London in August 1817. So I'm afraid to say that overall, the Welsh Government report is insufficiently rigorous in its handling of the evidence. It operates with a simplistic understanding of the nature of 19th century political discourse, and it does owe in a significant injustice, one might say a historical libel in portraying him in the way that it has. To put it in academic terms, the section of the report on Owen would not have got past any expert peer reviewers and needs to be revised and resubmitted. So with that elephant in the room sent back to the circus, let me now look at a second area, that of Owen and political reform. Now, one of the main criticisms that may be leveled against Owen is that from when he began to make national political interventions, in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars through to the 1840s, the early 1840s, he showed little interest in parliamentary reform and the extension of the franchise, which was perhaps the greatest cause of the radical working class and chartist movements. Indeed, he was either indifferent or even opposed to political reform for long stretches of this period. In his letter published in the London newspapers in August 1817, he stated that a reform of our great national institutions without preparing and putting into practice means to well train, instruct and advantageously employ the great mass of the people would inevitably create immediate revolution and give new and extensive stimulus to every bad passion. Violence would follow every party where the more or less virtuous, ignorant or intelligent would equally suffer in their turn. And in a short period, this empire and all Europe and the Americas would be plunged in one general scene of anarchy and dreadful confusion of which the late French Revolution will give but a faint anticipation. Now, it is tempting to judge such opposition as reactionary and indeed some political radicals opposed his schemes because they felt he was, even if admittedly sincere, a dupe of the establishment. But in reality, Owens was another evolutionary, peaceful, constitutional path to emancipation and citizenship. So I think you have to consider this phase, particularly the years 1816 to 25, as a missed opportunity to forge a broader coalition of the good. Owen has to share at least half of the blame here for a failure to communicate, to build optimal alliances with radical and reformers, who though they differed on points of detail, at least shared an ambition to see progressive change. And it wasn't as if Owen wasn't on reasonably good terms at various times with key radical leaders, including John Frost, Henry Hunt, Ernest Jones and Fergus O'Connor. But his priority targets lay elsewhere. Owen's approach was to attempt to convince the leaders of society, politicians, including cabinet members, prime ministers, bishops, archbishops, members of the royal family, leading intellectuals and writers, to convince them 
of the virtue of his schemes. He engaged them in correspondence, he sought interviews, he sent them copies of his pamphlets and speeches, all the while appearing convinced both of the logicality of his proposals and that it was possible through rational persuasion to change the world. Owen was mistaken in not appreciating the benefits that an extension of democracy could bring. His own method rarely delivered results, whereas a widened franchise at least held out the possibility of government in the interests of the majority rather than the property they leaked. But one has to recall that immediately following the Napoleonic Wars, there was no unanimity amongst those who wanted change as to how far it might be either practical or wise to proceed, particularly when there was very hardline opposition before 1832 to any change in the unreformed constitution. Now, this was a time of very considerable turmoil. 300,000 soldiers and sailors were demobilized after the defeat of Napoleon. There was enormous economic dislocation as 40 million pounds was no longer being spent on the war effort. There was a collapse in demand for iron and coal. The spring and summer of 1816 were the worst in recorded history. There was a trade depression, widespread unemployment. Demands for political reform that had been largely stifled by patriotism and government repression during wartime now resurfaced with vigor and urgency. Industrial disputes broke out as the Luddite tradition revived and there were incipient insurrectionary gestures at Spa Fields in London in 1816 and at Pentridge in Derbyshire in 1817. Habeas corpus was suspended, large political meetings once more prohibited. And 1819 was to see the reform campaign culminate in the demonstration at St. Peter's Fields, Manchester, illustrated here, violently dispersed by yeomanry and regular cavalry in what became known as the Peterloo Massacre. Owen's concern was that without appropriate levels of education or economic independence, extending the vote to the working classes might only reinforce the power of reactionary forces, an argument that would be repackaged in different contexts by the Liberal Party at the time of the Second Reform Act in the 1860s and by those opposed to what was called equal term suffrage during Edwardian debates on female enfranchisement. He was, half a century before the secret ballot was brought in, deeply sceptical about the existing practices of the electoral system, which rewarded bribery and intimidation. And he was very mindful of the fragility of the social compact in Britain in the late 1810s and early 1820s. Now, towards the end of his life, Owen shifted his position. In his 1848 address to the men and women of France, he argued for a European parliament elected by universal suffrage, off operating on the principles of free movement of peoples within a free trade zone. I wonder what happened to that idea. He endorsed the American constitutional model and finally supported the six points of the charter, believing that the working classes now had sufficient knowledge to enable them to assist all classes to gain in peace and with wise foresight, the rights of humanity for all of every rank and condition over the world. This was too little and too late to have any impact, but it does indicate Owen's capacity to modify his views based on what he saw as new evidence. The final problematic area of Owen's legacy, I might label his paternalism. Owen's platform for national political intervention from the publication in 1813 of a new, of a new view of society onwards was the combination of economic success and social reform that he had engineered at New Lanark. For him, this was proof positive that his ideas would work once they were extended to other communities and eventually to society as a whole. Now, there's no doubt that New Lanark was an enormous achievement, notwithstanding that the foundations of an enlightened industrial community had been laid by Owen's father-in-law, David Dale. New Lanark was visited by thousands from Britain, Europe and America. You can see some visitors on the left of this picture. They traveled to see firsthand the secret of Owen's success. And the example he set was one of global reach and significance, eclipsing anything comparable before or since. Raymond Williams, writing in Culture and Society, suggested it is so great a positive human achievement as to be virtually incredible in such a field in the years between the Luddites and Peterloo. 
But it has to be acknowledged that at New Lanark, Owen was in a position of very considerable power and authority over his workforce. He was able to shape the conditions in which they lived and worked with the greatest resistance probably coming from his business partners. Once he went beyond New Lanark, Owen rarely enjoyed that same level of control and the difficulties he ran into in New Harmony and, and in other ventures often came about because his ideas encountered resistance and he was unable to adjust, particularly to any conception of working class agency. Owen had a strong tendency to think he knew best and to be little interested in opinions which did not fit with his presuppositions. I chose uh, this uh, picture of Owen because there's, a, there's a, a sense of that character I think that comes through in this depiction. A stubborn refusal to compromise both made him into the determined prophet he was, but also limited his ability to build bridges with those with whom he needed to find common ground. And even among his admirers, there could be found widespread aversion to aspects of Owen's manner, his repetitious tone, his frequently dismissive attitude to those who might dare to question the validity of the philosophical assumptions on which his many projects were based. And even at New Lanark, these characteristics arouse some opposition, as has been demonstra demonstrated by Ophélie Simeon in her recent study, Robert Owen's Experience at New Lanark. Simeon argues that the New Lanark workers refuse to see themselves merely as employees and factory community dwellers. They understood themselves not as, in Owen's phrase, living machines, but as individuals and as independent citizens. Now, she acknowledges the lack of organised workers' resistance to Owen. There were no strikes in New Lanark while he was in charge, nor was there any episode of machine breaking. And a picture of relative, harm a picture of relative harmony is strengthened by the almost complete absence of crime in the village. Simeon refers to the positive testimony offered to the Factory Inquiry Commission of 1833 in respect of working conditions in New Lanark. And in 1818, 500, over 500 inhabitants of New Lanark submitted a petition supporting Owen's endeavours to protect child workers. But Simeon explains that some inhabitants of New Lanark were expressing serious discontent with Owen's views on religion by the 1820s. And she stresses that there were limits to Owen's reforms, particularly insofar as they impacted on the private sphere. Workers resisted attempts to intrude on their domestic arrangements, even opposing the attempt to bring gas lighting to workers' homes. Owen's plans to train the women of New Lanark in the principles of home economics provoked resentment. Workers welcomed social opportunities, such as dances and concerts, but Owen's attempt to extend the principles of the Institution for the Formation of Character to adults through evening lectures met with little enthusiasm. And Simeon draws attention to the hostility expressed by workers towards Owen's offer to step in to take over the management of the new Lanark Friendly Society when it appeared on the verge of bankruptcy in 1823. The workers declared that they should be seen as free-born sons of highly favoured Britain rather than be compelled by Mr Owen to adopt what measures soever he may please to suggest on matters that belong entirely to us. Overall, according to Simeon, resistance at New Lanark gradually led to a rejection of the close-knit personal relationship between master and worker that Owen had worked so hard to produce. So to summarise the first half of this talk, in any evaluation of Owen's legacy, we need to be able to recognise that his ideas and approaches were formed in a very different era, and at least some of them do not travel well into 21st century societies predicated on universal suffrage and concepts of citizenship, and societies enjoying levels of material comfort that would have been unthinkable in the early 19th century. To name a few more ideas that would appear problematic today, at New Lanark, illegitimacy was punished, Owen was negative on what he termed effeminacy. In later life, he was a spiritualist. Though himself brought up bilingual in Welsh and English, Owen believed that it would be to the benefit of the world if English became its universal language because, he said, the continuance of a, of a variety of languages tend to separate man from man 
and to create and maintain contests and wars throughout society. His plans for communities envisaged a clear gender division of labour, although to be fair, he was also an advocate of the universal establishment of the just rights of both sexes. That said, for every area of Owen's thought that appears distinctly historical to modern eyes, one might suggest there is at least another that resounds, reverberates and resonates across the centuries. And although time constrains what I'm able to outline today, I will focus on three. Owen's personal story of achievement and his determination to use his success for altruistic ends, his focus on the child and education, and what I might call his concern for the whole person. Now, one of the foundational precepts of Owen's thought was that environment determines character. We might see this as unremarkable today, but in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the idea that humanity's failings might not be attributed to the doctrine of original sin or be located in the inherent defects of individual souls was no less than revolutionary. So what was Owen's early environment and how might this have determined his character and the trajectory of its development? Well, we can begin by noting that Owen was of humble birth. His father was a saddler, an ironmonger. His mother was a farmer's daughter. There was economic independence, but no wealth. The family valued literacy, but education was confined to the local school and ended when Owen was 10 years old. At the same time, he, re he was required to contribute to the household income by working part-time at a draper's and haberdasher's shop. As the, the sixth child of seven, growing up in a very small town, his economic prospects locally were limited, so he left Wales to seek his fortune. With 40 shillings in his pocket, he journeyed to London and to his older brother William, who ran a saddlery in Hoban. Through his father's business connections, he found a new position as a draper's apprentice with James McGuffog of Stamford, Lincolnshire, and his first year was without pay, though with board, lodging and washing of his clothes. Over the next decade, Owen gained experience, wisdom and accumulated some personal capital. Having started on wages of £8 a year with McGuffog, he moved back to London to a salary of £25, working at a drapery store on London Bridge, and then up to Manchester on a salary of £40 at John Satterfield's. There until he was 18, Owen deemed himself overflowing with wealth, having more than my temperate habits required. Obtaining a loan of £100 from brother William, he attempted a business partnership making cotton spinning mules with a local wire manufacturer. He was quickly an employer of 40 men, was just as quickly bought out of the business and aged 19 set up on his own. This was the stepping stone to Owen becoming aged just 21, manager of leading Manchester merchant Peter Drinkwater's cotton mill, responsible for 500 workers on a salary of 300 pounds a year. This was, as Owen recognized, something of an incredible achievement. When it was known that Mr Drinkwater had engaged me, a mere boy without experience, to take the entire direction of his new mill, which was then considered almost one of the wonders of the mechanical and manufacturing world, the leading people thought he had lost his senses and they predicted a failure and great disappointment. Owen himself experienced significant self-doubt. I said to myself, how came I here and how is it possible I can manage these people in this business? I was diffident of my own powers, knowing what a very imperfect and deficient education I had received. I had solicited this situation, but I had no idea of the task which I had to perform, or I should never have made the attempt to perform it. Nevertheless, Owen was to make a great success of his management of Drinkwater's Mill, staying for four years before becoming manager and joint partner of the Chawton Twist Company, building new mills in the south part of Manchester. It was in, in attempting to expand the customer base of this company that Owen began to make trips to Scotland Ventures that would in due course lead to him both marrying Anne Caroline Dale, daughter of cotton master David Dale of New Lanark in 1799, and in 1800, taking over as manager and joint partner of the New Lanark Twist Company. So, by the time he was 30, Owen was a rich man, a leading businessman, and a bold entrepreneur. 
it wasn't exactly a rags to riches story. He was not born into absolute poverty. He had the benefit of some measure of family connections, but Owen could be regarded as an exemplar of a self-made man responsible for his own success. But what marked Owen out henceforth was his determination to use his money, his business experience, and the insights he gleaned into human nature and human society for what he felt would be the betterment of mankind. He committed himself to remake the world around him, initially in New Lanark, later across Britain, Ireland, America, Mexico, and Europe. He, in word and deed, distanced himself from, as he put it, the idle visionary who thinks in his closet and never acts in the world, instead attempting to put his theories into practice, expending enormous energy and exhausting his personal wealth, seeking answers to some of humanity's most urgent problems. One of those problems, as Owen viewed it in early industrialising Britain, was the experience of children, particularly those of the working classes. As he noted in his report to the County of Lanark, men are and ever will be what they are and shall be made in infancy and childhood. Particularly in his writings in the 1810s, he abhorred pre-literate children being forced into industrial work where they became living human skeletons, almost disrobed of intellect. In reaction at New Lanark, he reduced the hours of labor for children in the mills, a measure he later sought to have extended nationwide. And in 1816, he opened the Institution for the Formation of Character, a school for children between five and 12. This was handsomely equipped with hundreds of pounds spent on state-of-the-art visual aids with a teacher-pupil ratio of one to 18. The school taught not just reading, writing and arithmetic, but also botany, civics, geography, geology, his history, ancient, modern and natural. And the children were taken out on visits and field trips. There was great emphasis on enjoyment, on music, singing and dancing. Owen was determined to make education fun abolishing corporal punishment, encouraging his teachers to allow the children to play when it appeared that their concentration was wavering. A deputation from the Leeds Poor Law Board of Guardians in 1819 considered that the most remarkable thing about the education of the New Lanark children was the general spirit of kindness and affection which is shown towards them. Raymond Williams argued, that the infant schools of New Lanark were original enough in their educational techniques, but they were far more innovating in their humanity and kindness. When Owen talked of creating human happiness, he was not serving an abstraction, but an active and deeply impressive experience. His institution of these schools ranks as one of the major personal achievements of the century. Now, it wasn't to be until 1870 that the British state began a countrywide system of primary education, and then it was one that did not match the enlightened standards set by Owen more than half a century before. Owen's curriculum was essentially secular, dedicated to producing questioning minds and adults who would understand their place in the world. He was committed to a rational education which would not exclude the child of any one subject in the empire, especially those in the lower walks of life. He believed the working class deserved the same chances in life as those born into more fortunate backgrounds. As it stood, children were susceptible to being formed by various negative influences, including religion, nationality, language, class, sectarianism, and habits and notions imbibed from parents. But by appropriate education and training, Owen believed that children could be inculcated with an active and ardent desire to promote the happiness of every individual without the shadow of exceptions for sect or party or country or climate. The last of the three areas of Owen's legacy I want to consider is what I would call his concern for the whole person. From the very beginning of his adult life, Owen appreciated that those in his employ had lives that extended beyond the hours they spent in his cotton mills and that addressing their interests and needs in the round had to be a necessary component in his plans to move towards new and more satisfactory arrangements for society as a whole. 
At New Lanark, this involved some fundamental guarantees of what would become the welfare state model, providing medical facilities, factoring in provision for workers who were sick, injured or old. It also included ensuring the quality and reasonable pricing of goods available at the company shop and the building of, by the standards of the day, high quality workers housing, some of which is indicated in this print and is still in use. But Owen's vision went far beyond such immediate practical concerns. He aimed to create the environment in which the human character could flourish. That might involve laying out footpaths, which you can see in this print, through the beautiful Falls of Clyde, so that workers and their families might enjoy the striking scenery and marvel at the waterfalls. It embraced making provision for social events, including dances and concerts. And in the foreground of this print, you can see what I think is a brass band. He aimed to find ways of resolving disputes and quarrels within the community that averted recourse to law or worse, violence. He abhorred gambling and counseled against dependence on alcohol. He wanted the Sabbath to be transformed from a day of superstitious gloom to one of universal enjoyment and happiness. And again, this print shows people enjoying the scenery and the walks by the river. In his vision for future communities, Owen advanced the notion that every individual would blend agricultural and industrial occupations and would have access to lecture rooms, places of worship, libraries, grounds for exercise and recreation. Gardens were to be available for cultivation. Homes would be rendered in every way convenient and usefully ornamented. There would be central heating and a rudimentary system of air conditioning. Owen's attention to detail and his essential empathy for the lived experience of those he sought to help is for me captured no better than by his simple idea that bedrooms in these communities would overlook the countryside outside the settlement's walls, while sitting rooms of proper dimensions would face the interior square. In creating conditions in which men and women might flourish, Owen envisaged that there would be an end of all mere animal machines who could only follow a plow or turn a sod or make some insignificant part of some insignificant manufacture or frivolous article which society could better spare than possess. Instead of the unhealthy pointer of a pin, header of a nail, piecer of a thread or clodhopper senselessly gazing at the soil or around him without understanding or rational reflection, there would spring up a working class full of activity and useful knowledge with habits, information, manners and dispositions that would place the lowest in the scale many degrees above the best of any class which has yet been formed. Now in his mature years, Owen turned his attention increasingly to the familial arrangements under which men and women might live. He argued for a more liberal attitude towards sexual knowledge, less constraint and more awareness in the dealings between the sexes, liberalized divorce laws, which gave equal power to man and wife. He was suspicious of the nuclear family unit, worrying that little circles or worlds of their own might provide insufficient variety for children, as well as exposing them to the erroneous treatment of untrained and untaught parents. George Cruikshank had his own take on Owenite ideas in this print. There are many other of Owen's ideas and works that could be identified as a resonant legacy. He was an advocate of what we would call today an ethical foreign policy, of transparent diplomacy and of international arbitration. He planned to give Britain's colonies and dependencies self-government, this in 1832, while still receiving every aid from the mother country to improve their character and condition. He envisaged an end to war, rendered obsolete by an awareness of the shared interests of the whole family of mankind, with differences between nations resolved in an annual Congress, what price the League of Nations or the United Nations. And although I haven't discussed it today, in his multiple entanglements from the early 1830s with the Grand National Consolidated Trades Union and the early cooperative movement, Owen and his followers made an enormous contribution to the process 
as Edward Thompson characterized it, whereby capitalism was gradually warrened from within by the British labor movement, laying the foundations for what would become the Trades Union Congress, the ILP, and, the eventual, and eventually the Labour Party for British social democracy. As Friedrich Engels could acknowledge two decades after Owen's death, every social movement, every real advance in England on behalf of the workers links itself on to the name of Robert Owen. To conclude, in preparation for this talk over the last few weeks, amongst other things, I've been working my way through the four volumes of Robert Owen's selected writings, edited by Greg Cleese, and through the Penguin Classics edition of A New View of Society, also edited by Greg Cleese. I haven't quite finished the task of the 53 works available between those covers, I've still got 20 to go, but in refreshing my memory of Owen's ideas, I have been profoundly impressed by his energy, his optimism, the breadth of his interests, and his belief that the human condition could and should be improved. Of course, he was, like any man or woman, far from perfect. He can be accused of being at times authoritarian, inflexible, delusional, blind to things that for him were not priorities, unable to work constructively with others for more than short bursts, prone to lose interest when difficulties arose and complex problems had to be solved. Yet he was always generating ideas, working them through logically and transparently in his writings and speeches, works that remain accessible and fertile despite the passage of time and the transformation of conventions of political rhetoric. Robert Owen was simply tireless in his pursuit of answers to some of the most fundamental questions that faced human society then and now. How do we avoid poverty? How do we best educate our children? How do we avoid war? How do we ensure respect for beliefs that we do not share while also remaining committed to freedom of conscience? How do we build a sense of community and social cohesion? What balance do we strike between individual freedom and collective responsibility? The answers Robert Owen found to these questions won't always be our answers, but his life's example reveals that there need be no barriers to our imagination of creative and constructive solutions to our shared challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for what is a really inspiring uh, uh, opening talk. Uh, and I thought finishing off with those questions are almost the identical questions that we are asking at this very moment ourselves uh, on a whole variety of social and economic uh, issues, which I think is really, really important. Uh, because of time, I'm going to go quickly into questions. I'll take three questions that have come through so far and I'll try and summarize them very very quickly. The first one is a question from Chris Hall who, who asks about the Owenites and whether the group of Owenites, if they existed, was it a mere handful from the elite and if they existed did Owen try to cultivate them? He also asks a little bit about did Owen ever have any political uh, um, ambitions or aspirations and who would you say he would have supported politically or movements etc that was the first question dave smith asked a question about uh his dad 85 years ago uh, saying the trouble is with the co-ops and we've got a great history but no one seems to care do you think that is still the case today uh and then uh, i'm just well I th th then the other question from neil mulholland uh, and then I'll go back over to you now, Chris. Can you discuss Owen's debates within the co-op movement, in particular the 1830s co-op congresses, where he clashed with William Thompson, who drew differences with Owen regarding some of the flaws in Owen's thinking and the practices that you have mentioned? If there's time, I'll try and take some more after this, but I'm aware of the, uh, the limits we have. Thanks, Chris. Sure, thanks very much, uh, Mick. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best there. I mean. The first question, I mean, the Owenite movement was enormous. Um, uh, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think uh, how many. We're talking tens of thousands of people that were involved in the Owenite movement in the 1830s and 1840s, particularly through the, the Rational Society. There was an entire uh, physical infrastructure built up around that with Owenite uh, halls opened in a number of northern towns and other facilities elsewhere in the country. Um, it was a uh, diffuse uh, movement. It was not 
it was connected to Robert Owen. He was the he was the social father of the rational society. But I think it was at the same time very fertile in its in its thought, and it began to go off in all kinds of different directions. And that idea that that Owen was unsympathetic with uh, to, towards um, the Charter, uh, it gets very very blurred on the ground because many people are involved in Owenite and Chartist movements. So um, Owen, the Owenite movement is in a sense um, almost a separate topic. And um, I was just talking there at the end about Greg Cleese's um, uh, edited volumes of Owen's works. He's also edited uh, a significant multi-volume edition of the pamphlets of the Owenite movement, which uh, you know is well worth, well worth a look. Um, in terms of his political ambitions, yeah, Owen stood for parliament. Um, on a few occasions, I forget exactly how many, in the book, Robert Owen and His Legacy, which Noel Thompson and I did, there's an essay by Margaret Escott um, on Owen as a parliamentarian or as a would-be parliamentarian. And she does, she does look into that. He, was, wasn't, um, he wasn't successful, but he, he did see that as a potential way to influence um, the direction society was was taking. Um, who would he have supported? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I don't think, I mean, that's always a, a, a deeply problematic question. Um, you know, you're always tempted to sort of line him up with the people you support, of course. Um, but I, I find it very difficult to think he'd be in sympathy with Boris Johnson. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I, I tell you what I do think, uh, and I say this, you know, observing uh, British politics now from uh, across the Irish Sea, I think I think he would be, I think he would be pretty impressed with uh, Mark Drakeford's administration and the way it's handled the challenges over, over the last couple of years. I have to say that, um, and I, I say that as a former member of the Labour Party. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, the, the the history of the cooperative movement. Why don't we? I think I think the question was why don't we? Um, in a sense, value that. I mean, I, as a historian, I suppose I, I, I always think about in terms of history and historical connections. So for me, you know, this is uh, this is something that's very, very meaningful, and I think that history uh, has got the power and and must be seen as important in connecting us, connecting the movements and the causes that we're committed to, um, and seeing where the 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 the, the, leg, the, um, the sources of nourishment for that come from, um, because. I first went to New Lanark actually on holiday uh, in 1994. Um, I didn't know an awful lot about Robert Owen at that point. Um, profoundly enjoyed the visit, you know, and and in a sense, there's a connection that, that goes back there to, to me as an ordinary citizen, not necessarily as a historian, um, just visiting that site and understanding something of the impact of that man and what he, what he achieved. So for me, history has to be everywhere in what we think about. Of course, you've got to treat it with respect. And that, that, I suppose that was what I was trying to say at various points in the talk there. You, you know, you've got to appreciate, this is a very different world he's operating in. It's a very, very different world. You know, life expectancy um, was such, most of the people on this call, I suspect, wouldn't have been around, you know, in the 1820s, because we wouldn't live that long. So, yeah, I think you always have to bear that in mind. Um, the Cooperative Congress. Now, to be fair, I, I haven't read up on this very recently. William Thompson, of course, is a, uh, a Corkonian. And um, if I look out of my window here in University College Cork and, and point in that direction, there is William Thompson House, which is where um, some of my colleagues in the School of Applied Social Studies are based. Um, so William Thompson is a really important political economist and radical. Um, who, in many ways, I think, as I understand it, theorised the labour theory of value in a more sophisticated way than did Robert Owen. Um, Robert Owen um, wasn't brilliant at working with other people. I think that's that's a fair point. You know, he was even his sons who were deeply loyal to him and and you know supported him and moved most of them uh, to New Harmony and you know built lives, really important lives in America, um, even his sons found him a bit frustrating. <laughs> so um, I think Owen could drive people spare, frankly, because he just wouldn't listen sometimes and he wouldn't shift his position. 
which, you know, it kind of gave him that consistency and that thread and that power throughout his life, but it didn't make him politically very effective at, at key times. So I think we have to recognise recognize that. But I, I suspect um, I suspect the person who asked that question knows a bit more in detail about that than I do. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, in the time we've got left, I'll perhaps just take two further further questions before we have a, a five-minute comfort break. Uh, one is a question on what his views were on prisons and reform, and of course that was a, a major social issue at the time. Uh, and the second point is actually one for me. Um, mm -hmm. Because of the work, I mean, some of it that I was involved in terms of the Black Lives Matters uh, issue, the issue of public monuments and so on, the comments in terms of the Welsh Government document, which uh, really seems to me needs to be revisited, whether you've actually put those arguments in writing to Welsh Government to uh, revise. It seems to me getting the record right is really important because of the legacy of inaccurate documents suddenly becoming uh, uh, taken as a sort of biblical uh, correctness. Um, yeah. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on those two points. Sure, thanks very much. Yeah, prisons. Yeah, I mean, Owen believed that in the future society, he wouldn't need prisons. Um, uh, so he was very optimistic that, you know, you could abolish crime. And, and within New Lanark, of course, he did reduce crime very, very significantly. He was very interested in prisons and in prison reform. And um, he actually visited prisons in London and spoke to the inmates and found out about their life stories and used that information to inform his understanding of human character. And I suppose one of his really urgent points that he was making in the 1810s and early 1820s was that in a sense, human society was so wasteful. We, were, we, ha we had all of these people, but because we weren't creating the environment in which they could grow up in a sense as, as intelligent and happy and useful members of society, we were ending up in a situation where lots of them turned to crime out of poverty and, 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 and to dissipation. And so he felt it was absolutely uh, imperative that uh, British society got to grips with that challenge to, to address that enormous problem of, of criminality. On the, on the government report, no, I haven't put anything in, in writing. I mean, but I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to do so if that was thought helpful. I mean, I read that report and, and I kind of, was a bit concerned about it. And then I went and did a lot of reading about this and, uh, and, and obviously the, the, the fruits of that, of, of what I've kind of encapsulated in that discussion today. And I think it is really challenging um, because in a sense that context is so very, very different. But I do think we need a somewhat more subtle appreciation that Owen's position on this was, was in a sense much more sophisticated than that report appears to me to conclude. Um, so I think there's something that could be done there. I, I wouldn't say uh, it just needs to be me involved. I think there are other scholars on Owen who would also be able to comment on this, particularly perhaps somebody who would be an export, expert on American utopian communities who might be able to put the New Harmony thing in perspective. So, you know, some of the language that Owen used doesn't, it just, just doesn't travel well. Some of those arguments don't travel well into the 21st century. But I think at the same time, we have to appreciate the specific context in which they were being uttered. And I think, I think that report doesn't do Owen justice, to be fair. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's a really important point. I see a message from Dave, uh, from Dave Smith saying we are we are on the we are on the case. Um, that, listen, that brings us to the end. Thank you ever so much for. I found that really inspiring and uh, informative, and a lot of lot of things to to think about. Um, we've come to the end of this session. We uh, have a five minute comfort break, as the terminology is these days. Um, so if we can come back at uh, 10.35, where Chris Hall will again uh, uh, open the session and introduce Jeremy Miles as chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mick. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.